When I was the chaplain of San Francisco de Paula, I had an experience that was uh, extraordinary. I lived there just at the foot of the church, and I was on my way home one night. I never finished so late that I didn't first check to make sure the doors to the sanctuary were closed up tight. I found them secured and locked, but I happened to notice light peeking out at the bottom. Alarmed, I ran to get the watchman, but not finding him, I turned back and I stayed in the churchyard, not knowing what to do. The light, without being all that intense, was too bright to be from thieves. Besides that, I noticed it was steady and even, not moving side to side as it would from candles or lanterns, if people were stealing. Well, the mystery of it compelled me forward, and so I went home and found the keys to the sacristy. The sacristan had gone to stay the night in Niteroy. So I crossed myself, opened the door, and then went inside. The corridor was dark. I carried a lantern, and I walked very slowly, trying to step as softly as I could. The first and second doors that connected to the church were closed, but the same light was visible and perhaps a bit brighter than on the street side. I continued walking until I found the third door open. I put the lantern in the corner with my handkerchief over the top so that no one could see it from the inside, and I got closer to get a glimpse of what it was. I soon stopped. It was only then, in fact, I realized that I had come entirely unarmed and that I was going to run a big risk showing up in the church with no more weapon than my own two hands. Well, a few minutes went by. The light was exactly the same in the church, steady and even and a uh, milky color, not like candlelight. What disturbed me even more was that I heard voices, not whispered or confused, but regular, clear and easy in the manner of conversation. At first I couldn't understand what they were saying. In the middle of this I was struck by an idea that gave me pause, because in those days corpses were entombed in churches. I imagined the conversation could be coming from the dead. I backed away, terrified, only after some time I was <laughs> able to move again, and I arrived a second time at the door, telling myself that an idea like that was nonsense. I would find the reality more chilling than a dialogue of the dead. So I put my faith in God, crossed myself once more, and moved ahead, sneaking closely along the wall until I finally entered. And then I saw something extraordinary. Two or three saints on the other side, St. Joseph and St. Michael, to the right if you entered the church by the front door, had descended from their niches and were sitting on their altars. Well, they weren't their usual dimensions, but man-size. They spoke toward the side I was on where the altars of St. John the Baptist and St. Francis of Sales were, and I cannot describe what I felt. For some time, which I can't calculate, I stayed put, moving neither forward nor backward, covered in goose flesh and trembling. No question about it, I was walking on the brink of madness saved from falling into that abyss only by divine mercy. I can assure you I lost consciousness of myself in every other reality that was not that one, so unprecedented and beyond compare. Only this could explain the temerity with which, after a short time, I entered into the church, enough that I could see the opposite side, and I saw there the same thing. St. Francis of Sales and St. John descended from their niches, sitting on their altars and talking to the other saints. My stupefaction was such that they continued to talk, it seemed to me, without my even hearing the sound of their voices. Little by little my perceptions of them returned. I was able to see that I hadn't interrupted the conversation. and I could distinguish them and hear the words clearly, but I couldn't make out right away what they were saying. One of the saints speaking in the direction of the high altar, made me turn my head, and that's when I saw St. Francis of Paula, the church's patron, doing the same thing, and he spoke to them while they spoke to themselves. The voices didn't rise above a medium pitch, and yet they were easily heard, as if the sound waves 
had received a higher power of transmission. But if all this was astonishing, this was no less than the light which came from nowhere because the chandeliers and the candlesticks were unlit. It was sort of like moonlight penetrating in, but with no moon in sight. It's an accurate comparison, because if it were real moonlight, it would leave some dark areas, and that's how it happened. And it was in one of these where I took refuge. By that time, I was moving ahead in a trance. Life, during this entire time, felt nothing like life as I'd lived it before nor anything after. It's enough to observe that, facing such a strange spectacle, I became completely without fear. I lost any capacity to reflect. I knew only to listen and to pay attention. I realized, after a few moments, they were taking inventory and commenting on the prayers and the pleas of the day. Each one of them quoted something, all of them, formidable psychologists, had penetrated into the souls and the lives of the faithful, dissecting the feelings of each one just as an anatomist uses a scalpel on a cadaver. John the Baptist and Francis of Paula, hardened ascetics, showed themselves at time to be annoyed and absolutist. St. Francis of Sales wasn't like this. He heard or recounted things with the same willingness to forgive he had advised in his famous book, Introduction to the Devout Life. And so, according to each one's temperament, they went on, narrating and commenting. They were in the middle of recounting cases of faith, some sincere and chaste, others indifferent or dissembling and wavering. The two ascetics were the far more irascible, but St. Francis of Sales reminded them of the text in the Scriptures. Many are those who are called, but few chosen meaning by this that not all those that went to church came with a pure heart. St. John shook his head. St. Francis de Sales, I tell you as a saint, I'm getting a sinking feeling. I'm starting not to believe in these humans. Oh, you exaggerate everything, John the Baptist, said the holy bishop, cutting him short. Let's not exaggerate. Look, just today, something happened here that made me smile. And yet, though you would find it distasteful, Human beings are no worse than they were in other centuries, so let us put aside what is bad in them. What remains is pretty good. Believe this, and listening to my case, you too will smile. Me? Yes, you, John the Baptist, and you, Francis of Paula, and all of you will smile along with me. I'm happy to say I granted him his request. I've already interceded, and it was approved by the Lord that very thing he came to ask me for, this person. What person? A person more interesting than your clerk, Joseph, than your shopkeeper, Michael. Maybe, interrupted St. Joseph, but there's nothing more interesting than the adulteress who came here today, prostrating herself at my feet. She came to ask me if I'd cleanse her heart of the leprosy of lust. She'd quarreled just yesterday with her lover, who abused her despicably, and she spent the whole night in tears. In the morning she decided to leave him, and she came here to find the strength necessary to escape the clutches of the devil. She started out praying well, sincerely, but little by little, hmm, her train of thought began to leave the track and return to her previous pleasures, and her words, traveling on a parallel track, lost steam, and already the prayer was lukewarm, then cold, then inconscient on her lips, accustomed to prayer, went on praying, but her soul, which I observed from up here, was no longer in the church. It was with her lover. And finally she crossed herself, stood back up and left, without asking for a thing. My case is better. Better than this? questioned St. Joseph, curious. Much better, responded Francis of Sales. And it's not sad, like that poor soul wounded by worldly evil, which the grace of the Lord can always save. And why will he not save her lover, too? Well, here's how it went. Now, they all got quiet, leaning in, bust ways, listening, waiting. Here I became afraid. I remembered that they, who see everything that goes inside of us as if we were made of glass, hidden thoughts, twisted intentions, secret grudges— could easily have already read from me some sin 
or germ of a sin, but I didn't have time to reflect much, St. Francis of Sales began speaking. The man I saw was fifty years old, he said. His wife is bedridden, suffering from erysipelas on her left leg. He's lived in agony for five days because the disease got worse and no science was able to cure it. But now behold just how far public prejudice can go. No one gives credence to Sales' pain. Oh, yes, uh, he was named after me. No one believes he loves anything other than money. And as soon as word got out about his affliction, there was a hailstorm of jokes and sarcastic jibes from the whole neighborhood no one would believe he wasn't simply groaning in advance over the funeral expenses. That very well could be, mused St. John. This was not the case. That he is usurious and greedy, I don't deny. Usurious as life and greedy as death. No one ever extracted gold, silver, paper, or copper from the pockets of other people so relentlessly. No one infuriated people with such zeal and insistence for paying on time. Money that drops into his hands doesn't easily leave it again, and everything that is not in real estate is kept inside in a locker, iron, secured with seven locks. He does open it at times, in the dead of night, contemplating the money for a few minutes and quickly closes it again. But on these nights he doesn't sleep, or sleeps poorly. He has no children. The life he leads is sordid. He eats only so as not to die that is to say, very little, and horrible food. The household is comprised of his wife and a slave woman, who he bought, along with another one many years ago on the sly, as they were sold illegally. It's even said he never paid for them, because the seller died soon after, leaving no written record. The other slave died a short time ago, and here you can judge for yourself if this man does or does not have a genius for miserliness. Sales emancipated the corpse. The bishop fell silent to savor the astonishment of the others. The body? Yes, the dead body. He set out to bury the slave as a freeman who was penniless, so that he didn't have to pay his obligation of burial expenses. Outside of a little bit, he did pay something. But to him, no bit is little. It's with little droplets of water that streets flood, he says. He has no desire for office, no taste for nobility. All this cost money. And he said that money doesn't fall from the sky. Little socializing, no family recreation at all. He traffics in stories of the lives of others, which is, after all, free. Oh, one can understand the public's belief, deliberated St. Michael. Well, I don't disagree, because the world never goes beyond the surface of things. The world doesn't see that, beyond being a wife dutifully suited to him and his confidant of more than twenty years, Sales's wife is truly beloved by her husband. Don't be surprised, Michael. On that rough-hewn wall there bloomed a flower, discolored and without perfume, but a flower. The botany of the heart has these anomalies. Sales loves his wife. He is depressed and frantic at the thought of losing her. So this morning, very early, not having slept more than two hours, he began to consider the disaster that was coming. Despairing of all things earthly, he turned to God. He thought of us, and especially of me, who is his namesake. Only a miracle could save her. He decided to come here. He lives close by, and he ran straight here. When he came in, his eyes were gleaming and full of hope, plausibly the light of faith. But there was something else, very particular to him, which I want to tell you about. Now I want you to pay close attention. I saw their busts lean in even more. I myself couldn't help but move, and I stepped forward. The saint's narrative was so long and meticulous, the analysis so complicated, that I will not relate the details of it, but only the substance. When he thought of coming to ask me to intercede for his wife's life, Sales had an idea that was apropos of a moneylender, that is, to make his vow to me, 
in the form of a leg made of wax. Now, this wasn't the believer who was symbolizing by this thing a reminder of the blessing he was requesting. This was the moneylender, obligating the divine grace and expecting a profit. But this wasn't the moneylender alone who spoke, also the miser, because in truth, committing to that vow, he showed that he truly wanted his wife's life. That's his intuition of greed. To spend is to document. One will pay only for what one wants in the heart, his conscience told him, both out of the same dark mouth. You know that such thoughts are not formulated as others are. They are born from the womb of character, and they loiter in the dim recesses of consciousness. But I read everything as soon as he entered here, so excited, bright-eyed, and full of hope. I read it all, then waited for him to finish crossing himself and praying. Well, at least he had some religion, observed St. Joseph. Some, but it was empty and cheap. He never joined brotherhoods or third orders, because in them one steals what belongs to the Lord. This is simply what he says to reconcile piety with the purse strings. We can't have everything. It's certain that he fears God, and he believes in doctrine. Well, he kneeled and prayed. Prayed he did. While praying I saw his poor soul, which was truly suffering, and yet hope began to change into an intuitive certainty. God was certain to cure her sickness by command, thanks to my intervention, and that I was going to intercede. This is what he thought while his lips repeated the words of the prayer. Finishing the prayer, Sales remained for some time staring at his hands folded. Finally the mouth of the man opened, speaking to confess his pain, to swear that only the hand of the Lord could deflect the blow. His wife was going to die, going to die, going to die, and he repeated this litany without ever stopping. His wife was going to die, never deviating from it. His wife was going to die, but never getting on with it. And as he was about to form his petition and make his vow, he couldn't find the right words, nor words even close, nor even uncertain. He found nothing. He was so unaccustomed to ever giving anything. Finally, the request came out. His wife was going to die. He begged me to save her, to petition the Lord for her. His vow, however, is what he couldn't carry out to completion. The moment his mouth was going to articulate the first words of it, the talons of greed seized his innards and allowed nothing to come out. Would you save? Would you intercede for? In the empty space in front of his eyes, he conjured an image of the wax leg and immediately the amount of gold it was worth. The leg disappeared, but the gold remained suspended there round luminous, yellow, pure gold, twenty-four carat, finer than the leaf candlesticks on my own altar. Wherever he turned his eyes, he saw gold spinning, 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 and his eyes groped it from afar, and it transmitted back to him the cold sensation of its metal, and even the tactile relief of its stamped imprint. This was it, his best friend." of many years, companion both day and night. There it was, up in the air, spinning, dizzying. There it was, descending from the vaulting above us, a rising up from the floor, a rolling across the altar, going from the lectern of the epistles to the pulpit, or tinkling the pendants of the chandelier. Now the pleading in his eyes and their melancholy were more intense and entirely of his own free will. I saw them reach out to me, full of contrition, of humiliation, of helplessness. His mouth was uttering some stock phrases, God, angels of the Lord, blessed wounds, tearful and trembling words as if to paint with them the sincerity of his faith and the immensity of his pain, and yet the vow, the offering of the leg, did not come. At times his soul, like someone who musters all his courage to leap across a trench, stared blankly, fixating on the death of his wife, wallowing in the despair she would soon bring him. But then at the very edge of the trench, when he was going to make the leap, he retreated. 
the gold manifested again, and the vow stayed put there in the man's heart. Time was passing. The hallucination grew, because the gold accelerating and multiplying the number of leaps multiplied by itself, and there seemed an infinity of leaps, and the conflict was each time more tragic. Suddenly, the fear that his wife could be breathing her last froze the man's blood, and he wanted to hurry. She could be passing away. He asked if I would intercede for her, if I would save her. Now here the demon of greed suggested to him a novel transaction, a strategic shift, telling him that the value of prayer was exceptionally fine and much more excellent than earthly works. And Sales bent over, contrite with his hands folded, the submissive gaze, helpless, resigned, requested that I save his wife. To save his wife, he vowed a sum of three hundred, no less, three hundred Our Fathers and three hundred Hail Marys. And he repeated emphatically, three hundred Our Fathers, three hundred Hail Marys, three hundred! And it went up from there, reaching five hundred, a thousand Our Fathers, a thousand Hail Marys. And he saw this sum in front of him, not spelled out in letters of the alphabet, but in numerals, as if they were more alive more exact, the obligation greater, and also the greater seduction. A thousand Our Fathers, a thousand Hail Marys, and the tearful and tremulous words returned the blessed wounds, the angels of the Lord. One thousand, one thousand, one thousand. <laughs> the four digits were growing so large that they filled the church from top to bottom, and along with them grew the man's efforts and confidence as well. The speech poured from him ever more rapidly, impetuous, non-stop. Thousand, 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 thousand. Go on now. You can laugh to your heart's content. And all the other saints laughed indeed from the heart, not in that grand, unbuttoned laughter of the gods of Homer when they saw the lame Vulcan serving table, but a modest laugh, easy, blissful, and Catholic. And then I could hear nothing more. I fell roundly on the floor. When I soon realized it was broad daylight outside, I ran to open all the doors and windows of the church and the sacristy to let in the sun, enemy of bad dreams. Among Saints by Machado de Assis, first published in 1896, translated from Portuguese for audio performance by Todd Connor, copyright 2020, with a few notes of music from Chiquinha Gonzaga's Santa, composed in 1903. If you like this work and would like to support The Cary Orker, please consider making a purchase at the Cary Orker Podcast Store. A direct link is available on the website at www.thecaryorker.com. Or if you'd like to make a donation, click on the website's link for PayPal. Commercial or private sponsorship of future episodes can include the recording of a story live at your own location. See the website for details. In the meantime, as always, listen, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.